working to save as the notion of a large professional newsroom, a sizable collection of skilled, professional people who are dedicated to and paid for serving their communities with quality, quality verified reporting delivered without fear or favor. And in fact, I'd say that the local newspaper's role as the town square of information of news, of news and information has never been more important. You know, we live in this age where everybody seems to, to be building their own little information silo, um, narrow echo chambers of like-minded people who think just like they do. Um, there's a quote from James Carville, one of the political analysts you see a lot on television, and, and I love this quote. He says, Americans these days use the media the way a drunk uses a lamppost for support, not illumination. <laughs> the, the people are really looking for, I, for the, the reinforcement of things that they think they already do. <clears throat> so what, what we're about in, in this increasingly balkanized world is to stand out as a community beacon, not, not in the way it's been in the past, not necessarily this, in fact, very much not in this sense of one-way communication, um, the one-to-many model, but, um, but a place where civilized and informed conversation and information uh, exchange can occur. And besides, without the large news gathering force that a newspaper represents in a local community, you might not have very much news at all. Um, you might be familiar with this 2010 study by the Pew Research Center on people in the press. And it found that even with a proliferation of all these news sources of news information, about 90% of local news still originates in the so-called legacy media. And most of that starts in the local newspaper newsroom. So then there's a question of, of economics and can newspapers and professional newsrooms survive? Um, and again, you know, we can't ignore that bad news, so I'll, I'll review that part of it quickly. Um, as you know, newspapers all over the country um, are under siege. Um, this is just over the past few years, you know, we've seen the uh, Seattle Post Intelligence, or we were a two newspaper town in Seattle, that one closed down. Um, Detroit Free Press and Detroit News are not delivering uh, home delivery seven days a week anymore. The Ann Arbor News is online only. I should say the PI is online only, but it's really just uh, lingerie football and, and kiddies, uh, and basically. Uh, Rocky Mountain News, once great newspaper, closed down. And just just destruction and, and uh, retraction all over the country. What's driving that, of course, is this decline in, in newspaper advertising revenue. Um, the, the news, the, the revenue field, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the advertising and revenue field is, is just changing dramatically. Um, I don't know if you can see the colors, but you know, this is the overall level of, of in millions of dollars uh, spent on print, on newspaper advertising. Um, the blue part of the bar is print and the, uh, the red part is online. So the red part is growing slowly, but not coming close to, to matching the decline. Here's another way. Uh, that you can slice that just for print. So this is retail advertising, and a lot of this is driven by the consolidation of department stores, that kind of thing. Uh, and then, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is the print total. This is retail, this is national, and this is classified ads, which have uh, been a dramatic decline, due mostly to this thing, and, and light sites. You know, this is just a much better way to, to find what you're looking for many of those things that, that people used to go to the printed newspaper for. Now, it's interesting, there's a little bit of backlash to that. I notice even among my own kids who are about the, the age of, of people in this room, when they're looking for a job, they're, they're more and more going to newspaper websites because they feel like the quality of what's listed there is a whole lot better than what you generally find on Craigslist. So there's a little bit of hope there. Um, one thing that isn't talked about very much at all is the loss of newspaper advertising to direct mail. You hear a lot about how much we've lost to the internet, but in fact, we've lost at least as much and probably more to junk mail. And that, that it raises some really interesting public policy questions because that's, that's subsidized by the low cost uh, provided by the U.S. Postal Service. So um, a couple of you, well, three years ago now, and. Robert will remember this well. We were faced with um, possibly going out of business. We were in a joint operating agreement with the first owned paper. We're a family-owned paper. Uh, the family has owned the paper for 116 years. And 
we, this was a, a quote in Time Magazine in January of 2009. So Seattle could become the first major U.S. city without a daily newspaper. Both papers were struggling financially. Readership was strong, but really struggling financially under this uh, false uh, forced partnership that we had. Um, fortunately, we beat that prediction. And, and what's been really fascinating, I won't go into the details of how we beat it, but the, let's say the, 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 the large uh, multi-industry corporation, the Hearst Corporation, which owns half of ESPN and Oprah Magazine and lots of other things, they uh, um, amazingly sort of snatched the feet from the jaws of, of victory and, and this little family-owned company survived. And when we did, since then, it's been very much a sense uh, of uh, that people have when they when they have near death experiences where you see the white light and, and you made it through on the on the operating table and, and now it's hey let's go skydiving that's very much the attitude that we have in our newsroom and, and it's manifested in a lot of ways we have as I said committed local ownership this family the Bluffton family that's owned us for for 116 years now uh, the end of this uh, weird joint operating agreement that we had with first We've gone in the past two years, and since then, since that near-death experience, we've gone from being the eighth biggest paper on the West Coast to the second biggest by circulation. And we're nowhere near the second biggest newspaper, or second biggest city. But um, this reflects that we've been able to hold on to our readers and many of the, the PI's readers while the California papers, you knew all too well what's happened to them. Um, one of the interesting untold stories about newspapers, and this isn't just the case for us, but it's the case really uh, across the country. You see a lot of the graphs that talk about the decline in advertising revenue. What you don't see is the rise in circulation revenue. So we have raised the price of our paper 40% over the last five or six years for home delivery, and we've raised the single copy price. We've doubled that. And look what's happened to our, this is the money we get from people with wanting the newspaper, the printed paper, and paying for it. Um, it's, it's pretty dramatic. And then, of course, um, you know, we, we put a lot of time and energy into our website. I will say Robert was a real key uh, person in the foundation of this, and it's been tremendously successful for us. Um, we, we are really moving towards an integrated newsroom that has uh, given us tremendous strength as a 24-7 news source in which people are using us in, in various forms. We are um, by far and away the, the most trafficked local news website in the Northwest. These are the numbers we're looking at. I mean, they're really mind-blowing sorts of numbers. We've gone in the last five years from 2 million unique visitors and about 20 million page views a month, which seemed enormous to me. And in five years now, it's 7 million and there's 62 million page views. Just huge audience. Um, across all of these ways that people look at the Seattle Times, we reach regularly seven out of every 10 adults in our metropolitan area. And surprisingly, there's there's really strength even among young people. And this too is, a, is, I think, a great untold story about newspapers. And again, this is not just the printed newspaper, but what we're finding among a lot of people under the age of 40, they, they like reading the Sunday printed newspaper. They like that Sunday experience and sitting in the coffee shop with their friends. Um, and then they, they look at their phone or their tablet or the computer during the week. But even among the youngest groups, two out of three are regularly consuming Seattle Times content. Obviously, there are huge challenges ahead. Um, we, we really do need to figure out the business model here in terms of print advertising, which was the mother's milk of our business. It's clearly not coming back. We have to respond to the changing habits of consumers, which are, are changing as fast as we can keep up with them. Um, a lot of newspapers have debt. Um, we have very little of that, fortunately. And then another thing you never hear about, but is a really big factor for the newspaper industry, especially newspapers that are in the northern half of the country that have labor unions. They have huge pressures to pay pensions uh, to their current and former employees. 
and pension funds, which were traditionally overfunded, uh, now are severely underfunded because of what's happened to the economy and to interest rates. Um, journalistically, uh, the challenge is obviously there's tons of competition. Uh, this whole notion of news as as commodity and um, standing apart from that and then changing expectations and roles in, in terms of how people see journalism. Um, as we look at this evolving model, what, what really uh, strikes me most though is that we know how to attract audiences and when we go out and do consumer surveying, it's the strength of our brands, our brand in Seattle, and I'm sure this is the case in many, many cities in America, the degree to which people cite that they trust us, um, that they value, particularly the investigative and accountability journalism we do, it is phenomenal. And, and it's not something, it's something that I think is underestimated and undervalued in discussions about the industry. There was a story in the Los Angeles Times last week about a company named Demand Media, which many of you are familiar with. It's headquartered just down the street here in, in Santa Monica. Um, they uh, offered an a IPO earlier this year, a couple of months ago, I think, maybe, maybe late uh, 2011 or early 2012. And since then, their stock has just taken a tremendous hit. Um, in large part because Google's algorithm has been changed and has put more emphasis on quality content so that what demand media puts out uh, is, is much less value. And the, the CEO of that company, a guy named Richard Rosenblatt, said, the hardest part about building a web business is how to build an audience and maintain it. Well, newspapers have that part figured out. We know how to build an audience and maintain it. We don't have to make money <laughs> off it enough to, to, at this point, but, but that audience strength is really uh, something that gives me tremendous optimism uh, going forward. So as we forge ahead in my newsroom, um, we have this very simple mantra, which is you know, news you can't get anywhere else, so that's that emphasis on unique, valuable content, when, where, and, and how you want it. Specifically, we're focused on these goals more unique, impactful reporting, true multi-platform newsroom, and, and particularly the idea of, of curating the news at a very high level of design and editing across platforms. Uh, more and better community engagement, growing revenue, of course, so we're, we're tuned in with the revenue departments so much more than, than we ever uh, were in the past, and really focusing on having a fun, smart, and energetic workplace, which I'm proud to say that we do. Now, most newsrooms, in newspaper newsrooms, have been organized in this very simplistic fashion. When Robert was with us, this is the way we were organized. Um, we had a print operation and a web operation, a much smaller web operation. Um, and for the most part, um, content that was produced on the print side, it was, it was very much uh, produced on a manufacturing cycle. Um, that, was, that was built around a deadline in which you printed the newspaper. And then the content was sort of thrown over a wall for people like Robert to figure out what to do with electronically. Um, we had a very major um, restructuring of our newsroom uh, last year that was built to start to address some of these goals that I talked about. So our new newsroom is, is built in, in this fashion. Um, first, we have a group of people who are very focused on creation and you know, these are the people who are very outwardly focused my, my concern about one of my big, big concerns about the nature of journalism the state of journalism right now and in newspapers and elsewhere is that there's so much focus on the pipeline and so little focus about what's going into the pipeline so much focus on technology so little focus on reporting and performing the act of journalism so these people they're they're their focus, far and away, is performing the act of journalism. And, and that includes reporting, investi investigation, verification, writing, photography, video, and graphics. Then we have a group that's very much focused on the curation of what those people produce and what we get from elsewhere. So these are people who are engaged in editing, design, organization, making sense of everything that's out there and, and 
support for the platform in which it's presented, standards, presentation, and prioritization. Um, we very much do not adhere um, to, to the motto you hear around in the business uh, about being platform agnostic. We reject that totally. Um, we want to be very, we want to be platform perfect, platform orthodox. We really want to focus on what what do people want out of various tools. For this, you know, I want to be able to get breaking news, the weather, traffic. I want to get that stuff very in a very quick, easy manner. Um, when I'm on my iPad, I want a much more curated experience. So that's much uh, that that is a finite. Um, thoughtful, more of a lean back experience. The newspaper is more like that. So, and the web is, is a mixture and more interactive. So that, that group is very focused on that. And then we have a group of people who are very focused on community, um, both in terms of engaging the community with the content we produce, but at the same time, getting much more tuned in to the wisdom that they can give us and the content they produce. So it's interactivity, outreach, partnerships, inclusion, diversity, actual physical convening of people, and social media, which is a, a very big uh, focus for us. All of this around this goal where all these things come together of engagement. And engagement, you hear a lot about uh, from a journalistic standpoint, but I'm, I'm convinced it's the key to financial success too. Advertisers more and more are going to be looking for measures that your, your customers are really engaged, and we're convinced that this sort of a setup um, can do this. All of this pivots around the idea that news is, is not this one-way communication, but very much a conversation, and we acknowledge and promote that in a variety of ways. Um, our blogs provide a way to highlight our expertise and personality and engage readers. They range from <coughs> food blogs to, to sports blogs, which produce astounding levels of traffic, uh, technology blog, uh, live chats with readers every single day on a variety of, of topics, sports, business, entertainment, politics. Um, we have areas of the site where readers can talk with each other, with us there only as moderators, as sort of adults in the room to keep the conversation uh, civil. Um, we're using more video than we ever have as an important storytelling tool. And one of the most uh, unusual and exciting steps we've taken is the creation of a network of local blogs. Seattle has this thriving blogosphere, as you might expect, in a, in a very wired community, and as I'm sure you have here. And rather, to, rather than um, to try to either beat them down or compete with them or somehow co-opt them, um, we decided a couple of years, years ago to embrace them and to partner with them. We began two years ago with five blog partners, and what we do is we feature their content on their on our site, but we we link to them so that they get the traffic. Um, we we began with five, we're up to nearly 50 now, and these are uh, mostly geographically based, but some are communities of interest. Um, we have uh, the, the, probably the, the perhaps the most famous. A local neighborhood blog in the country, the West Seattle blog, which is a real trend center there, one of our original partners. Um, but we have a biking blog, a boating blog, and a beer blog. And these are all people in the community. These are all organic uh, entities uh, that grew up out of needs, mostly covering things that we never covered. So it's not like, oh, they're filling the void. We never covered neighborhoods. Um, and now we're able to offer our readers so much more by featuring that content on our site and, and reinforcing this idea of us as the town square of the community. This map shows you some of the neighborhoods uh, that, that are in our network. And then, of course, we're heavily engaged with social media. We've got uh, many Seattle Times, Facebook, and Twitter pages that are both institutional like this, and then our staff has individual uh, pages. Um, even I regularly tweet, and I'm up to almost 2,000 followers now. <laughs> and then um, we're paying a lot more attention to, to metrics. Um, this is a TV screen in our newsroom um, in which, you know, at, at any given moment down to the 15-second in increment, we're looking at what people are paying attention to. Now, this important thing to note here is this is driving um, not just 
we don't respond to that just in terms of, oh, people are reading this, we've got to give them more. Often it informs us, hey, here's something we think is really important, and it's not resonating with readers. Does it need a new headline? Does it need different placement on the page? What about it isn't working? So back to what, where we started. Why should, you, why should our readers care uh, about we, uh, whether we or, or any local newspaper survives? Um, you know, I would say the most important reason is this. In the case of the Times and other good papers, these are institutions that are committed to serving the public good. Not long ago, I stumbled upon this. I was going through some old material. And this was our uh, Seattle Times mission statement from 1920. It's printed every day in the newspaper. And I, I just love it because it's a mission that in many ways could still serve us today. And, and it's all true except this part. Favorite above all others in time. I'm not sure exactly where that came from. And here's a mission statement we use, we use today. It's, it's a little less lofty, but it's no less ambitious. Fundamental mission is to serve this community to the quality independent journalism. We're committed to being the most read, most influential, most indispensable, most trusted source of news and information in Washington State. We're our region's watchdog, its storyteller, and its town square. We deliver useful, relevant information when, where, and how our readers can best do it. So again, this idea, you know, not platform agnostic, but one mission that's served on, on many platforms. So I'm going to show you a little video here um, that reflects how all this is coming together in our newsroom and, and how the dynamic works and, and how um, with one uh, one breaking news story, this this all manifested in ways that were incredibly satisfying for us and, and, and incredibly meaningful to the community. Um, happened to win uh, the 2010 Pulitzer Prize in breaking news reporting, and notably last year, the Pulitzer Board did not award a, a prize in breaking news reporting. And in not doing so, they cited that we had we had set standard the previous year in our reporting for multi-platform use, and nobody last year had really met that standard. So that was um, both uh, really satisfying and humbling for us. So I'll share this with you if I can figure out how to get it going. There we go. And yeah, we might want to we can turn the lights down a little bit. I think that would be. And I saw the AP alert uh, indicating that four officers had been shot. That was the only that was the only news they had. And the newsroom was close to full already. And what I recall was that everybody was simply I'm okay, sorry, I'm going to stop this because I neglected to set the stage for this properly. Um, this began on a, a Sunday morning, it was Thanksgiving weekend uh, of 2009. Sunday morning, and as any of you who've worked in, in newsrooms know, there's usually one person in the newsroom at you know, 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, somebody who's just checking the wires and sort of getting things started. And uh, that was the case here. We, I, I think we had one editor and, and maybe one reporter. And we got a, a news alert that four police officers had been shot in Lakewood, Washington, which is a suburb of Tacoma, uh, about maybe 35, 40 minutes uh, south of Seattle. So again, the, the scene is one person in the newsroom at that point. Alert, uh, indicating that four officers had been shot. That was the only that was the only news they had. And the newsroom was close to full already. And what I recall was that everybody was simply bearing down. I just called a lot of different reporters and uh, and and answered the phone because a lot of people were calling to say, "Can I come in and help?" I look at my phone and I see the breaking news. 
I saw what happened. Immediately dial into the newsroom, figure out what's going on. We create a hashtag, wash shooting hashtag. There hadn't been one created yet, and people immediately started using it. And it was going gangbusters. And there was so much information coming in that I simply couldn't keep up. The shared file just kept growing. I would write two paragraphs. I would check back on the shared file, and there would be two or three more uh, listings. There was not even a moment in between because I would send a web and publish, and then a reporter would call, and I would take the dictation, and I would grab it, put it back on the file, edit it, send a web and publish again. Jennifer Sullivan had gotten the suspect's name early on. My guess is that we probably had at least a four or five hour jump on every other news organization. And within that time, we were able to build a really compelling profile of Maurice Clements, not only who he was, but how he came to be free on that day. We combine not only the tragic news of what happened and also the background of Mr. Clements, but also we were able to piece together the profiles of all four of the officers in a pretty short order. They, you know, obviously, their, their deaths resonated well beyond the law enforcement community. They all had families. And we were able, I believe, to accurately portray what the effect was, what the impact was on their families. We kept translating images to try to keep photos updated online. Um, and also, that evening, we shot video. One gentleman, who I heard secondhand, had um, helped the baristas from pour the coffee. We were able to find him. I was able to do a quick interview. Suddenly so pulls up his coat and pulls out a gun and turns around and starts shooting other officers. The reporters and photographers were on the front lines of every piece of the story, and, and a big piece of the story on Sunday and Monday was the manhunt. And Cliff Dispo, one of our photographers, was right there on the front lines. And um, he found his way onto a balcony so that he could watch police surround a neighboring home. We thought, well, let's get Cliff to tweet. And sometime in the middle of the night, we got a phone call from the Seattle police. They were very nice. They said, could you hold that guy back a little bit? And it occurred to us that he might signal to a suspect or somebody helping the suspect what's going on. So he slowed down the streets. On Monday, it just kind of hit me We'll just use Google Boy. We'll just try it. He kind of got bogged down when we had close to 500 people on the actual way, but it was like email, chat room, wiki, but with rich media capabilities, so you can collaborate on a map together in real time. Symphony is just one of those tools where you can organize things and in the timeline format, video, photo, text, and it creates some kind of chronological narrative which was useful here because we're talking about a 40-hour manhunt and people want to know as things are changing. It was essentially a cat and mouse game, whereas the police were chasing the suspect, we were chasing the police to see whether the suspect had been caught. I believe I left here Monday night about 11. The game plan was that we had somebody stay, a reporter stay in the park runner to alert, to listen to the scanners and check in and alert uh, an editor when and if they found Mr. Clemens. But my wife tells a story that the phone, the phone rang at three, I woke up probably, grabbed the phone, and before I could say anything, my wife heard from, from the other side of the room Jennifer saying, they got him, they got him. Several rounds. Uh, took the person into custody. The Seattle Fire Department responded immediately, and uh, in, uh, all indications are that he is deceased. Uh, and that's all we have. In the end, the, the reason we were able to do as well as we did on this story was because of this ethic of serving our community through quality journalism, being accurate, being sensitive, and thinking about our community. And without those tools, without that journalistic integrity, this story wouldn't have told the right story. You did not have a conversation with Mark and not realize that his family came first. Now, Mark's been taken from us, and 
and we are without the person so many of us rely on. We are left to always remember the man he was, follow the example he set, cherish the family and friends left behind, and I know, no matter where I am, no matter where I am in my career, for years to come, I will always look for Mark's nod of approval from the back of the room. I was proud of our team and how we work together and how um, the photography and multimedia and with the web and print, we broke, we did our jobs, but we also, I think we broke some new ground. So again, um, I think it's it's such a good illustration of, of how the place is working these days and, and the different ways that newsroom is functioning uh, than, than it was certainly when I began my career there. And, and even this, this is two years ago, we've come so far in those two, or I guess two, yeah, two years ago, we've come so far in those two years in, in terms of how, how we're using uh, various media, how we're connected to the uh, community, I would say we're using uh, social media much more effectively as a news gathering tool uh, than we were before. But at a time like this, certainly on, on a major breaking news story that affected a community, um, every almost every Sunday when we present some piece of meaningful watchdog journalism uh, to our community and accountability journalism, um, the, the relationship that we have with our community, I, I would say, is as strong or perhaps even stronger uh, than it's ever been. Um, the numbers, again, the numbers of, of readership are extremely strong and growing. Um, the, the number of people who are willing to pay for the product uh, at, at not insignificant amounts is very encouraging. And uh, again, I'm just incredibly optimistic that there is a future uh, for newspapers, uh, however they're delivered. So, video question. Part, was the video part, or could it be part? of your uh, Pulitzer submission? It was not. It was produced afterwards, and I don't think it could be because it's a video about the coverage instead of the coverage itself. But, you know, that that's a video that was produced by our newsroom, which, you know, five years ago we couldn't have done something like that. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. So people can fire away with questions or comments. Yes. Uh, do you, does the Seattle Times monitor um, the reporters personal tweets or like their their Twitter pages and if so or if not, like have you guys had a situation where maybe a reporter tweeted something that was, you know, made the public reactive negatively to We've been very it's a it's a great question, first of all. Uh, we've been I think more lucky than good in that regard, but knock on wood we haven't <laughs> had any any real situations. We are strongly encouraging our reporters, particularly, and, and most of our journalists, photographers, editors, um, to, to establish personal Twitter accounts that they use professionally. Um, we have had a staff and uh, a, a staff committee made of management and, and line people that has drafted uh, social media guidelines that are not particularly either restrictive or prescriptive, but they're more guiding in the sense of, here are the questions you ought to be asking yourself before you push the send button. Um, and so our, our people have been very, very thoughtful, yeah, I think for the most part in that use. So um, fortunately, we haven't had any, any real problems. Now, I, I think it's a really significant issue for journalism, and in fact, you know, I, I'll share with you, I, I was, I believe, the first person to call out a journalist last week, Jason Whitlock, uh, who's a sports journalist, who uh, tweeted out an extremely offensive uh, comment on Jeremy Lin. And I actually brought it to the attention of AAJA, Asian American Journal Association, and then they went on to demand and, and ultimately get an apology from him. So, I, I, I think it's it's really dangerous ground for us, and at the same time, it's essential ground. We've got to be there. What else? Okay. I'm very interested in how much money you're making and how that 
breaks down between the print product and, and other forms? Well, the, the print, print, the mix is changing. Um, print circulation revenue is now about a third of our total revenue, and as Geneva knows, that, that was never the case in the past. Basically, newspapers were given away to subsidize the, the advertising. So now circulation revenue re represents about a third. Um, digital advertising revenue is about, maybe a tenth, and then the rest is, is print and advertising revenue. But you are making money. Yeah, not a lot. But our company never made a lot of money. I mean, the people who own us, I, I'm very blessed to work for a family that says, we make money to publish a newspaper, not the other way around. It's privately held. We don't have to meet somebody's stock, Wall Street's stock expectations. Um, but you know, we're, we're making enough that we can be a, a viable going concern. Have you had to do a lot of cuts? We've had to do a lot of cuts. Yeah. Do you? Uh informally or formally uh, make production demands on your uh, news gatherers, on your reporters. In some sort of metrics they have to meet or yeah. something? No. Can a guy go out, spend two weeks on a story and come back and tell you there's no story? Absolutely. In fact, I'm pleased when they do that. Because that means they've actually done some reporting. As long as that's not the norm, you know, right. <laughs> this is somebody who's productive. You know, when we have people, we still allow people to spend a year on a story, if it's a good enough story. Um, so yeah, we, 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 you know, we certainly expect production, we do performance reviews, we, you know, we expect everybody to contribute at a high level, and those who don't are, by this time, between, you know, we've had enough rounds of buyouts and layoffs that most of those people have decided to go. So everybody who's there now, they're energized and, and, and they contribute at a high level, but we don't have some sort of report card of X number of bylines a week. Or how many people, did you, editorial people, did you have at its peak and how many do you have now? At the peak we had 375, that would have been back in 2003, and now we have about 200, so a significant cut. Um, and I'm not one of these editors who says, oh, you know, we just do more with less. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, we do less with less, but I think we've, we've become much more focused on what's our essential value. We spend a lot less time doing things that are commodity and a lot more time doing those things that are unique and, and most valuable. Yeah? What if you, how do you get community to be so supportive? I mean, you know, they're paying more than you two, and, and your numbers are up. What have you guys done to draw the community in to, to, to build that support? From yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's a, it's, it's a variety of factors. One is that, and, and it really does begin with the fact that we've been owned by this local family for more than a century. So we are all very much of the community. Yeah, we hire people all the time from other places, but um, we're blessed also with having a, a, an incredible, wonderful, beautiful, livable city where people come to work and, and they don't usually want to leave there. So um, they, they, we all are very uh, woven into the fabric of our community. We make, and, and particularly with this reorganization, we make real efforts to for both community outreach, bringing people in. Uh, as an example is. Uh, in our Wednesday news meeting, which is our major news meeting looking ahead at the next week and, and the Sunday paper, um, we have something we call the community chair. And we invite people in. Uh, they are specific targeted invitations, although people can volunteer to come. But um, we invite people to come into the meeting, both to see how we function, to participate in our news meeting, and then we keep them for an hour afterwards and talk about what are the issues in their lives and jobs and worlds that we're not seeing and, and stories we're missing. So we've had people from, from uh, business, um, we've had people from the, the owners of the Seattle Storm, we've had people from Occupy Seattle, which was an interesting experience because I, I asked, okay, can we have some of your leaders? And they said, we don't have leaders in the Occupy movement, so, but we'll send you some representatives. 
Um, yesterday, we had a guy who is essentially a professional socialite. Um, he is somebody who makes a career out of connecting people, mostly at parties. And so he, he gave us all kinds of great gossip about things. And, and so you know, that, that's, a, that's an example of the kind of thing we're doing to just keep us connected. What's his business model? He, he, he's got a great, his business model is he winds up on the boards of a lot of companies and nonprofits because they know he, he produces access. <laughs> Brief uh, joint operating agreement 101. It, it's a it was a law that was passed in the 70s as part of uh, what was called the Newspaper Preservation Act um, that was actually aimed at preserving multiple newspaper voices in cities and it actually had some success for many years and it did in our town. So we had two papers that were fighting tooth and nail back in the in the 70s and undercutting each other in ad rates and circulation rates. The law allowed uh, this partnership basically a, a a, an exemption from antitrust laws in which it, we were in this partnership with, with Hearst where we would print their paper, sell their advertising, deliver their paper, and then we would split the joint profits. Um, we got two-thirds, they got one-third. We were an afternoon paper initially, they were a morning paper, we had the Sunday paper. Worked well for about 15 years, then we moved to morning and their readership collapsed and, and then they sued us and it got really, really messy. And I, you know, to this day, I can't quite figure out why they decided to walk away from it other than I think they thought my boss, who's the patriarch of our company, Frank Leffen, I think they thought he was just crazy enough to hang in there and take the whole thing down, <laughs> which he may have been. So um, they, they abandoned ship. They, they, they framed it as, oh, we're going to have a great, be the nation's first online only newspaper in a metropolitan area but it's it's really they, they cut initially to 25 people and now i think they've got about 10 in their newsroom so it's quite pathetic oh advice um you know that i i think it is it's clearly the most challenging time in our business but i think it is far and away the most exciting fascinating and interesting time um, there's so much opportunity in, in newsrooms. I wouldn't get hung up at all um, a, as jobs begin to come back, and they are beginning to come back now. I wouldn't get hung up at all on what the job is, or even too much about where it is, but um, you know, where you wind up in the newsroom, it used to really matter, so you were on the copy editor track, or the reporter track, or the photographer track. Now, you just get yourself <coughs> inside that newsroom, and, and as one person, and particularly as one young person who's getting the kind of training you're getting here, and you know, Robert was an example of that. We have a woman named Sona Patel, um, who was a former Southern California journalist who's our social media uh, director. And the, the impact that one young person can have in a newsroom is mind-blowing today. So it, it, it's a great time to be a, a young journalist. What is the pay range of your, what is the pay range of those news gathering people? Um, not for publications. No, but my students are going to ask me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we have, we're a guild shop, and you could look and see what the guild range is. You know, I would say it ranges from about forty thousand at the at the for the newest reporters um, to six figures, the low, very low six figures for the the really most experienced. Is that video available online? Um, I don't believe it is, but I can leave you a copy. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that the readers are becoming more engaged once you change the way to interact with the community. So have you ever considered like setting up a paywall for the Seattle Times? And if so, what's the reason not to do it? Paywall? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we actually are thinking about it. We're about to launch in the next couple of months a suite of four paid digital Products we have um, we have mobile products now that aren't very good, um, and we're about to launch some that are that are going to be far better. And we're going to ask people to either pay for those or they get them free with a newspaper subscription. Um, that's 
that's the carrot part of the deal. We we do believe that ultimately we may have to have a stick part of the deal, with something akin to what the New York Times does. If we do one, if we do have. We, we think of it as digital subscription, not paywall. Uh, but if we have a digital subscription, you know, we're likely to say, all right, you get 20 visits a month free, but anything beyond that, um, you, you would have to either subscribe to the Sunday paper or, or pay. And the reason for that is our traffic tends to aggregate very heavily in, in um, two, two parts of a, of a curve. I can't, it's a, if you graphed it, it would be a camel. We've got the, the flyby people who come to us from uh, either search or social media who are all over the world looking for a story about Microsoft or Boeing or, or the Seahawks. Um, and then we have a very, very loyal local audience. So if you set the meter right, the flyby people will never even encounter a paywall. And the people who will encounter it first are your most loyal readers. So I, I think we're probably headed there. but. We're, we're trying to take it slow um, because what we don't want to do is to cut ourselves off from the community. And we're in a highly competitive news market. So even though we're the, the um, dominant news source uh, by, by quite a bit, we have television stations that are very aggressive and, and very good. And uh, we don't want them to pass us by. Yes? Two questions. One, um, is the city making a a plea at all for another NBA basketball team. <laughs> and the uh, second more serious one is, since you started at the Epic Company, has the focus of the news coverage changed at all, whereas you guys maybe were more um, local on the Washington area versus national or even international news? Um, yeah. Has that changed at all? Great question. Places? On the first one, just in the last two weeks, as a matter of fact, we've had a um, hedge fund a uh, million or a billionaire, I'm not sure which, um, emerge who has offered to build, uh, contribute almost $300 million towards building an arena for a new NBA and NHL franchise. And uh, so it's possible there's a lot of skepticism in the community, but they have their eye, uh, they have their eye on the Sacramento Kings or the New Orleans Hornets, depending on what happens there. Second one, yeah, it's changed, you know, it's changed in so many ways. I. I it's hard to even know where to begin, but um, you know we've always been a pretty locally focused paper, um, and we were blessed. We actually were blessed by being an afternoon newspaper, because for during the 70s and 80s, when when a lot of papers were still very much sort of paper of record, you know, report what happened yesterday. We always had to be thinking about second day angles and in depth and enterprise and investigation. We have a great history of investigative reporting at our paper. Begun, in fact, um, by a young reporter in 1949 named Ed Guffman, uh, who, who won a Pulitzer Prize for us in 1950 on an investigative story. But so, so we had Those that. Those of you who did not know Ed Guffman, he was a longtime professor here at USC Edinburgh, which is why it's right. nice to be <laughs> And uh, so we had that, that legacy. But when I began there, the typical front page mix would be four national and international stories off the wire and one local story. And now it's the opposite. Um, we're very focused on local regional news. We know that's, that's the news you can't get anywhere else, uh, particularly if it's enterprise watchdog uh, in-depth reporting. And we don't we, we, we still have a, a nice and I think very intelligently curated presentation of national and international news. We still have a Washington Bureau, which many local papers don't have. Um, but um, we, we really try to present that in, in a much more concise and northwest, in a northwest prison, um, knowing that people can get their international and national news lots of other places. So it's really nice to have a local tie with the, yeah. with the Seattle area for you to send a reporter to say wherever. Yeah, you know, we send reporters. We send reporters around the world still two or three times a year, um, but it's always going to be something that at least has some tie to the Northwest, or it could be an it could wind up being a national or international investigation, uh, but maybe begin with with something in our region. One last question. 
the uh, how much when you are hiring? Uh, what percentage uh, of the new people you hire, young people, are uh, have journalism degrees, and how much more important or less important is it that they have a master's in journalism? Um, I would say most do have journalism degrees, but that's not. It's not because they have journalism degrees, because we hardly ever hire anybody right out of school. Um, usually they have had two or three jobs before they get to us, and it just so happens that most of them have come from journalism programs. Um, you know, I Does myself, that mean their clips are more important than their degrees? Yeah, the clips are way more important. I mean, it, it's something I struggle with. Cause I, I, had a, I have a bachelor's in journalism from Medill, and then I have a master's in communication from the University of Washington that was really focused on um, public policy and, and politics. Um, you know, I, when I, I, and I have a daughter who's in a journalism school right now, so I believe in, in this sort of education at schools that really provide a, a broad spectrum and the opportunity to really focus in on some other area. Uh, of study, particularly economics, or uh, something that I think they can can really use uh, in the journalistic world. A master's, um, you know, it, I I I I really like the um, the path that is a liberal arts undergraduate degree and a master's in journalism or communication. I often advise students these days to, that that's a good way to go. Well, that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much, Daddy. Yeah. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to. He will. They're in engineering. Yeah. Oh, I'm not so you made them what they are today. Like yeah. It's funny, um, they're we all making that video. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Which was, which was the CIA. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing well? Yeah. 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 Yeah.